So hello everybody and welcome to this webinar from Thorn Lighting on Let's Talk Light. This is the second session. We have four sessions. If you've missed the first one, it's still available to actually view either via YouTube or through the Thorn Lighting website. This session is on ecology, so design to care. Then we have a session on durability and a final session on sustainability. So four sessions all linked together with a common theme. So this one, we're going to talk about ecology. And you can see one of the problems immediately. If you look at that picture, you can look at all the light points and understand that this is a light that is coming up into the sky. This picture was taken from space effectively. So anything it can see is light that isn't going on the ground and isn't going onto the target, but is getting projected into the sky. And you can effectively pick out all the areas that you know in the world and see them because of the big light spots that they are on the map. So my name is Peter Thorns. I'm head of strategic lighting applications. Everyone is muted. And the procedure for questions is, at the end of this presentation, I will show my email, but it's there as well. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me and I shall do my best to answer them. So when we talk about lighting, how do we respect ecosystems and the environment? And there are some fairly straightforward concepts, or at least they sound straightforward. Define what you want to do. Most of the time we say, I want to light a road, or I want to light a footpath, or I want to light this car park, which is a starting point. But instead of just defining what you want to light, define what else is there is in that area. So define what you don't want to light. Define what the conditions are. Are there any rare plants, animals, anything that you need to consider outside that just basic lighting in the road? Because if you don't know what all these things are, you won't know if you're respecting them with your solution. Consider how you control your light. So we have lighting controls. Lighting controls means you can change your lighting levels, you can turn your lighting on and off, you can change your lighting colour, you can change everything about your lighting dependent upon the situation. If you've defined what you're trying to do, then you will actually understand that at some times of the night, you don't need the same lighting. So don't just light it because it's expected or don't just light it because you put the lighting there, you might as well have it turned on. Light for what's happening in that space and that area. If there's nobody there, you really don't need the lighting. Consider where you're directing the lighting. By defining where you don't want the lighting to go, that actually gives you some constraints and it makes you understand, yes, I want to light this space and I don't want the light to go here. Then you can direct it to the right space and make sure it doesn't go to the wrong space. Think about colour. Generally, warmer colours are better in the evening and night time because they have less impact on the environment and the ecosystems. And if you think about the, the basic question, why is the sky blue? The sky is blue because short wavelength of light, so blue end of the spectrum, scatters in the atmosphere more than long wavelength light. So you're seeing all that blue light scattered in the atmosphere. And it doesn't have to be up, the, up in the atmosphere for it to happen. It happens on the ground. So the lighting you put up, the cooler the light, the more the light will scatter and create sky glow. So think about the colour, not only for animals, plants, people, but also for the impact on things like sky glow. And then importantly, where are you going to put the lighting? We have this constant balance between how many light points we have to how well we can control the light. If you put fewer light points at higher mounting positions, you will need less light points, but you can't control where the light goes as well. If you bring the lighting to lower levels, you can control it better because you need lower light output from each light fitting, but actually it's closer to the target area. There'll be less scatter and less drift of light into places you don't want. So you have to think about all these facts. They really sound obvious, but it's so often that people miss some of these points out. 
And actually, excess light is a problem. We're having big discussions at the moment about what excess light should be classed as. Is it pollution? And if you went back 10 years, we always argued light was not pollution because it didn't have a long term impact. If you turned the light off, your light pollution disappeared. We're now having a different discussion because perhaps light is pollution. Even if you turn the light out, the impact of the over lighting of spaces is now. Biodiversity is changing and disappearing. Animal behavior is changing. Some animals just can't live in certain spaces anymore. So whilst the light itself has a relatively short impact, it's on or it's off, it has a long-term impact that might mean it is a type of pollution. So we have to think slightly differently. Short wavelengths and long wavelengths have different effects on different animals and plants and ecosystems. On the whole, we try to avoid sort of long, uh, shorter wavelengths or the blue end of the spectrum, because that's generally the most harmful area. So we have to be able to light the outdoors. People want light to make them feel safe, but we have to do it in a respectful way. So we have to respect nature. We have to respect the planet. So for people, cooler color temperature tends to give more clarity. As it gets darker, your, visible, your visual system shifts. So during the day, you have a slight bias towards the sort of yellow, green, red end of the spectrum. As it gets darker and your lighting, your, your visual system moves between cone vision, color vision towards rod vision, which is your night vision, it actually moves a bit towards the blue end of the spectrum. So all of a sudden, blue light has a bigger impact for people. But actually, it also has a bigger impact on people in sleep patterns. So we have to be careful. Blue light tends to wake us up. It changes our circadian rhythms. And it has a bigger impact on plants and animals. So cooler light, I didn't say cool light, but cooler light at certain times of the night when there's lots of people about might be useful. When there's not many people about, you want to think about warmer colored light because you want to start thinking it's not about how well can people see. There's much more to it than that. So you have to use different light mixing technologies to create different light scenes, depending upon what you need at what time. And you can see an example here. At the start of the evening, we have 3000 Kelvin. Now that's not cool, that's still quite warm, but it's cooler and it will give a nice feeling light for the people that are out at that time of the day. As it moves to the night, it will show, slowly shift. So we move to 2,700 Kelvin. As you get in the deepest part of the night, actually, there's not going to be that many people there. We can really go that bit warmer. So you're moving from considering what people are doing to considering what ecosystems are doing, what the plants, what the animals, all these things are doing. And then as you head back into the day again, you slowly ramp up because people are starting to move about. So you're trying to respect both the people and the planet. And not just light in colour, what about light distribution? Different activities need different quantities and qualities of light. So why do we just light them the same? If we have a pathway or a cycleway that's next to a road and we detect a car, we turn the lighting on for everything. If we detect a, detect a bicycle, we turn the lighting on for everything. Why can't we have separate distributions that just light what's needed at that point for the people who are there? So we can change the lighting just the same as we can change the colour. We can actually change the distribution. LED technology, because it's digital and because it's pretty well a point source, we can make it do all sorts of things that we could only dream about doing with the old HID technologies. So why don't we really use all these possibilities properly? Because then we're still lighting for people, we're still giving them the light they need, but actually we're not doing anything more. We're not giving them the light they don't need that's just wasted light. And that actually helps us save energy. And lighting controls help us save energy. So if you think about when we need lighting, we need lighting when people are there. 
on the whole, humans have very, very poor night vision. You compare it to all the animals, the animals can see in the dark much, much better than we can. So actually the lighting's only there for us. Turn the lights off, the animals will still be able to see. So you only need a light when people are there. You only need a light depending on what people are doing. And even then, as you go through the night, you can start to balance it because if there are less people, there are less obstacles, there are less potential issues that they might have. So there's, you probably need less light. If you look at how we do road lighting standards, we light the roads dependent upon how many people are using the roads at a particular time. As the number goes down, in principle, we don't need as much light because there's less people there to cause a problem. So we can reduce the lighting and we can take that sort of an attitude and put it into everything we do. So we can control the lighting accurately and efficiently, the right light at the right place at the right time. And not just with lighting controls, but also with optics. So we have to control the light and make sure it goes where we want it in the right place. So we have different optics. We have RPEC and APEC, which just stands for road and area. But actually within that, there are different lighting controls. And you need to make sure you don't fall into the trap of almost being a bit lazy, of always using the solution you understand. Because every solution is good in some situations, in other situations, it will be a compromise. Make sure you use the right solution for the right situation the right optical system. Because if you do that, you'll minimize spill light and you'll avoid obtrusive light. And you will limit light trespass. Now, this is another one of those terms, a bit like light pollution, that we're having to think about a bit harder. Because originally the difference between obtrusive light, light that goes where we don't want it to go, and light trespass was that light trespass caused a problem in terms of irritation or health. So the light trespass went somewhere that affected people. And if you imagine the light outside comes into your sitting room, you can't see the television properly, that's annoying. If it goes into your bedroom and you don't sleep properly, that's bad for your health. But if you take that concept of being bad for things a little bit wider, light trespass almost starts to cover plants, animals, ecology because it's still causing those problems. It's not light that missed the target, but it doesn't matter. Any light that misses the target area matters if you consider the wider sort of ecological viewpoint. So we have to think about light trespass, not just about people, but about the entire environment. So how does this work in practice? Well, we'll show one case study, and this is where we installed some urban ballards this is Coed Mellon Park, and for anyone who is in Wales, I apologise for that pronunciation. But effectively, it's just under six acres of woodland, and it has some very well used paths within it. So they wanted to look at the paths and they wanted to be able to light them properly and light them so they could still be used. But you have all the ecology of six acres of woodland. So how do you do this? Well, it had to be bat friendly. I always get nervous when people say bat friendly. There are lots of species of bat and different species of bat react to light differently. So actually, you might find that some species of bat, this would not be friendly for them. So when you say, is it good for bats? Actually, what type of bat are we talking about? But in this case, it's bat friendly. It's quite, it's that quite warm level of light, 3000 Kelvin. It's a low mounting height, so there is no spill light. If you actually look at the line of the path, the path is well lit, and then it cuts off almost immediately afterwards. Now, this is where you have to involve the general public, because do they feel safe in this space? Because the light is low level, it's not particularly going to light faces, and that's how we look at people and decide do they look friendly do they look unfriendly do i feel safe it doesn't particularly like the spaces off the path that's good for the ecology but actually some people might find that 
makes them feel nervous. They can't see who or what is happening, except on that narrow ribbon of path. So ecologically, it's a very, very good solution. Always think about the people that use it and how it gets used and whether you need two solutions. One that actually does spill a little bit of light wider in the early parts of the evening and then comes back, or one that just lights the path. So it's that mixture. How do you make lighting good for the people that use the space whilst respecting the nature? And it's a balance. And there will always be one side of that balance that perhaps comes off a little bit worse than the other side. So if we do things better, we can actually look after the ecology better. We can preserve the environment better. And we have the tools to do that now. We just have to actually start using them in the correct way and use them carefully. Don't just accept that we did this 20 years ago so we can do it now. 20 years ago is a different world. Think about what we do now, question things. Why do we do it that way? Why do we assume we should do this? Because if you question why you do things, you come up with better solutions. So that was a quick look at ecology. Like I said, it's part of a, a sort of webinar series of four very short webinars. Lighting the night and best ways to do it. That was has been and gone, but you can see the recording. We have a, a webinar on durability on the 28th of April and a, a webinar on sustainability on the 5th of May. So hopefully you'll get a chance to attend them as well. So I'm finished. If you have any questions or any comments, please do get in touch. You can see my uh, email there. And I'd just like to thank you for attending. Thank you for your attention and wish you all a good day and stay healthy. Thank you.